The Italian maiden saga highlights the fact that we have a white, hereditary, aristocratic and highly privileged royal family as the symbol of a modern, progressive, multicultural democracy. Does the panel think this is a problem, and will this arrangement continue to survive in the 21st century? Grace Blakesley. I'm glad you came to me first, Ian, as I think you know how I feel about the monarchy. No, I mean, as a Republican, um, I obviously don't think that in a, a modern, allegedly democratic society, we should be having a hereditary monarch monarchy as the uh, as the head of our state. Um, I think this really speaks to the need to kind of modernise British democracy more generally. We really kind of you know, never had that full democratic revolution, which uh, is reflected in the fact that we have all these kind of archaic elements to our democracy, like because the monarchy, the House of Lords, the fact that, you know, the City of London, local authority is actually a private corporation. All of these things date back to the kind of feudal way in which um, our, our economy and our society was once, once organised. And I think it's completely and utterly out of place in a modern democracy. But would you accept that your views do not chime with the majority of the British public and, and the Republican movement, if there, if there is such a thing, hasn't really made any great progress, I would say, probably in the last 20 years? I mean, I don't disagree with you. And obviously, you know, the fact of saying we need to reinvigorate... Well, that's a first. <laughs> oh, sorry? I said that's a first. <laughs> no, it's not. We've agreed on many things before in the past, Ian. And also... Have we have. Uh, spicy disagreements as well but no i mean obviously when, when i'm talking about democracy here if the majority of the british population does want to keep the monarchy it's not a position that i personally agree with but it's not also a kind of hill that i'd be willing to die on to be honest i've found the last several weeks of coverage of all of this stuff not particularly enlightening given all the other massive massive issues that our country is facing at the moment um so i'd be quite happy never have to have to talk about the monarchy again to be honest well, that is something that we can both agree on. Um, Alicia Cairns, what's your view? I mean, I think this has been a really sad uh, state of affairs, really. And I think anyone who's watched the Harry and Meghan interview just leaves with that sense of sadness because, you know, this is ultimately a family dispute playing out for the world to see. And I think what it's really shown is that to America, the royal family is nothing more than another soap opera, whereas to us, it's our royal family. It is an institution to which I serve as a member of parliament. Um, and I just think it's a real sad state of affairs. I think we need to move forward. And I think the royal family statement yesterday was a dignified one. And I think it's one that says, look, let's draw the line under the sand. Let's focus, let's learn, let's improve. Let's make sure we're not just moving on and forgetting what's happened here. But I think really the whole country just feels saddened and we do need to move forward from this point and not let an Americanized uh, fascination with soap operas and turning our royal family into one become that focus. But they've turned themselves into one, haven't they, to be fair? I mean, it's not untypical. Most families have their soap opera elements to them, um, but it, it is something that they've caused themselves by their behaviour. I mean, I think it's a difficult one because none of us have been there and seen exactly what's gone through. And you can understand why, if you feel that you've been muzzled, uh, you would want to get your side of the story out. That's, you know, something you can understand completely. But I think the dignified thing to do when you are in that position um, is to really focus on trying to deal with it privately. And really what we all want to see is the family heal and come back together. And I think privately is clearly the only way that's going to happen. Chris Bryant, it's been a fairly unedifying few days, maybe a few weeks. Um, what, what's your view on David's question? I'm pro-Princess Diana. That's about as far as my whole interest in this subject matter goes. Um, I was terribly upset. I, I, you'll, you'll laugh at me, but I mean, I was terribly upset when Diana died. It felt as if she had um, touched the funny bone of the British um, people in, in, in a strange way. And oddly, um, I, was, I was the person who put all those big screens up um, the, in cathedrals and in um, Hyde Park and so on, so that everybody could take part in the service. And one of the things that really upset me then, and I still sort of hold this, is that I'd got... Um, a printer to publish copies of the order of service so everybody in the country could if they wanted to take part in the service singing the hymns at the same time um, and um, the royal household I don't blame the royal family for this but the royal household said that we weren't allowed to print them unless I could guarantee that there would be a member of the royal family at each and every one of the different places where these people were going to be done um, so in the end I got the Daily Mail to print it instead 
<laughs> you and the Daily Mail united. Well, that, that that's something anyway. But... I have my moments with the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail have been brilliant on the on concussion in sport, which is one of my big kind of um, campaigns. So, um, you know, you, it, it, you get, wait, wait, as you know, Ian, sometimes you just have to lie down with the devil. <laughs> I don't know why you think I would know that, but anyway, um, the the point that I, know I made. You too well. <laughs> the point that I made on uh, Monday night was I thought that um, Prince Charles hasn't learned from history, and I think he comes out of this possibly worse than anyone with some of the things that uh, Meghan and Harry said. And he, the way that Princess Diana was treated, you would have thought that he might have learned a few lessons from that and maybe understood a little bit more and been a bit more empathetic to the position that Harry has, ha- that has adopted. Um, do you think he's got questions to answer? Oh, I don't know. Um, I remember going as a Labour MP um, for newly elected 2001. We were all summoned to St James's Palace to meet um, Prince Charles. And um, I mean, all the Labour MPs sat at one side and all the Tory MPs sat at the other side. And when Prince Charles came in, all the Tory MPs stood up and none of the Labour ones did. Um, and it was all very awkward. Everybody sort of stared at each other. And, um, uh, you know, I... Um, I feel quite emotionally about it all in a strange way, and I think a lot of people do. I don't know whether you've watched The Crown. I thought the most moving episode of the lot was the one about Aberfan. Um, when I think it, there are moments when it is genuinely very, very difficult for a royal family that has to stay out of politics um, to show um, a bit of ankle, as it were. Um, mm-hmm. Terribly, terribly difficult to, thing to do. So I... I would hate being a member of the royal family, um, and um, so I'm still. I'm just pro Diana. Okay, we got that message loud and clear, um, Andy Sylvester. I don't know what your your views are on Diana, but what are your views on that interview and David's question? I mean, as Alicia said, and I think most people agree, it's just incredibly sad for for a whole number of reasons. See a family tragedy like this, it's sad for the family. It's it's yeah, it's a so proper within their family, and it's difficult to move on to. But it's sad too, I think, for the institution and the royal family because of two reasons really. One, you know, Meghan's arrival into the family was, and I know we look back on it, and and recollections may vary to coin a phrase, but the the coverage around the wedding, the coverage on social media, the coverage in newspapers was overwhelmingly positive. Some of it even a bit self congratulatory about you know, what a step forward this was for not just the royal family, but for Britain. And we had some relatively constructive discussions about race and modernity in the UK and about tolerance. That now is, is that ship has very much sailed and the conversation has moved in a very different direction. And I think the other sad thing about this is that the royal family, no matter what you think of how silly it might be for people to sit around the table at 3pm on a Christmas day to listen to the Queen, or, or to the, just the very institution, even if you are, you know, a, a fully full-blooded Republican, you know, the work that they do around certain causes um, in raising them up to, uh, you know, up the media agenda, be that Diana and Mines, or indeed recently William and Harry around mental health, all of that has to now take a back seat to this sort of family psychodrama played out in the media across two different continents. And I think it's a terrible shame that, we've got to a point where all of those things are just disregard not disregarded but they just won't be spoken about for some time the royal family can't do much um in terms of that level of positivity right now and frankly from a media perspective the blame is laid not necessarily with the royal family i think the media has a certain responsibility or whatever but mainly it lies with the royal household and the courtiers and the aides who haven't adapted to a world where we expect our roles to be more transparent we expect our roles to be more approachable and we expect all individuals to have more agency and more decision-making power over what it is that they do with their lives. Actually, uh, it's an interesting point. Uh, uh, okay, go, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to make... I, I mean, I, I would prefer a slimmer um, monarchy. Um, I was... Re- I'd be, I, I, um, you, you may recall there was the Atocha rail disaster um, a, a attack on, on, in Madrid uh, several years ago, and I, I went as the representative of the British government and um, to the memorial service. And it was really striking that the King and Queen just got in the lift with everybody else, of the King and Queen of Spain. Um, Very different situation from here. And and I would kind of prefer a more democratised royal family. 
David, uh, let's come back to you. You asked the question. Um, how would you answer your own question? Well, I would like to see um, a slimmed down monarchy. Uh, and if the monarch is to, is to remain as the head of state, I think the monarch should be able to express political opinions where appropriate. Otherwise, what is the, what is the purpose of being the head of state if you're powerless? Well, surely the, the purpose of head of state is, is to be above all of that. And if you think of presidents like the, the ceremonial president of Ireland doesn't have a political position, even though they may have come from the world of politics. Well, this is my opinion, OK? And secondly, I think institutions like the House of Lords, which are really a hangover of the aristocratic feudal historical system of government, we still have 90 hereditary peers in the House of Lords, one of whom stood up today and told the nurses that they didn't deserve more than one percent. Uh, I think that has to be reformed fairly quickly uh, to to restore some confidence okay. in our system of government. I mean, if you had Donald Trump appointing senators to the U.S. Senate, there'd be a huge outcry. 